Good morning. This is Jimmy. Back again. It's uh, Thursday morning, and uh, we're still in the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 13. And I think that uh, we'll probably finish today. I thought we would finish 13 yesterday, but we didn't. I'm always promising you that I'm not going to go too long today because I have to get out of here. But I, excuse me, I really do have to leave at 7.30, so uh, I'm getting started a little late for that mark, so I may have to cut it short. We don't know. But one thing's for sure, no matter how long it goes, I will pick up in the same place tomorrow, and we will continue. As long as I'm here, we will keep doing it. We'll back up a few verses because I want to bring this into context. In verse 18, say unto the king and to the queen, humble yourselves and sit down. <laughs> sit down and shut up. Good advice for politicians. Say unto the king and to the queen, humble yourselves, sit down, for your principality shall come down, even the crown of your glory. The cities of the south shall be shut up, and none shall open them. Judah shall be carried away captive, all of it. It shall be wholly carried away captive. Lift up your eyes, and behold them that come from the north. Where is the flock that was given thee? Thy beautiful flock. What wilt thou say when he shall punish thee? For thou hast taught them to be captains and chief over thee. Shall not sorrows take thee as a woman in travail? And if thou say in thy heart, Wherefore come these things upon me? Good morning, Gala. God love you. For the greatness of thine iniquity are thy skirts discovered and thy heels made bare. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Therefore will I scatter them as the stubble that passeth away by the wind of the wilderness. This is where we were yesterday. This is thy lot. God is speaking through Jeremiah to Judah and Jerusalem. And God says through Jeremiah, this is thy lot the portion of thy measure for me. This is what I'm giving you. A tumbleweed rolling across the desert. Verse 24, Therefore will I scatter them as the stubble that passeth away in the, wild, in the wind of the wilderness. God said, I'm making you about as useful and important as a tumbleweed rolling across the desert in a dust devil. Any of you have lived or been to the southwestern United States have seen this. This is my lot, the portion of thy measure for me, saith the Lord. Because thou hast forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. We spent a long time on this yesterday. It's a two-part thing. You forget me, God says, and you trust in lies. Anyone who doesn't worship the Lord God of the Bible, the God who lives forever, the only God there is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone who forgets Jesus, forgets the Lord, will believe and trust in lies. Because thou hast forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. He's going to delineate some of those things. He's going to list some of those lies. And remember, the entirety of this teaching that we've been going through, this study, is to show the parallels between ancient Judah and the United States now. That they are shocking, that they are real, that they are full, that they are complete, that they are... Undeniable. Good morning, Cynthia. God bless you. Cindy Clifton. It's just one of those things. 
God is judging in the end because the people have forgotten him and because they believe in lies they believe in falsehoods remember for 13 chapters now God has been explaining to Judah over so far a period of nine years during Jeremiah's testimony of why they're going to be judged that they're going to be judged and why they're being judged and what their outcome will be he's been and he tells them the reason for it the reason that they are going to be destroyed and go into captivity the reason that their house will fall the first reason was because of idolatry a spiritual fornication uh, spiritual adultery going uh, the Bible phrases it as a whoring after other gods and a God doesn't necessarily have to be a graven image or an idol or a totem pole or something or statue or something like that it can be anything between you and Christ anything between you and Christ is an idol anything that takes more of your attention than Christ anything that comes between you and him anything that comes before him your family can be an idol. I love my country, but America can be an idol too. You know, if you're an American first and a Christian second, you, you got a lot of trouble. And I, I get flack for this all the time. But God is destroying this country. And you're not going to stop him from doing it by explaining to God how great America is. Won't happen. Is America wonderful? Yeah, it is. I'd rather live here than anywhere else. I got a free pass by just being born here. A ticket to possibility. But you can't make it an idol. America does not come first. Christ comes first. So an idol is anything that you put more stock in than Jesus. It could be your wife or your husband. Maybe you think more of them than you do Jesus. It could be your job. It could be your new pickup truck. It could be your bass boat. It could be anything that you put between you and Christ. That is an idol. That is you and I, a whoring after another God. Because what is the object of our faith? The Lord Jesus Christ. So they were judged for whoring after other gods. Kevin, good morning. And then they were judged because they sacrificed their children on the altar to Moldak and to Baal. And God said that never came into my mind, but yet they were doing it. And we discussed many times that there are more ways to sacrifice your child than to have an abortion. We sacrificed a lot of children that way. We sacrificed many times that to this society, this godless society that we live in. We just turn them over and let the government take over their minds and schools. You know, knowing what I know now, uh, if, if I had it to do over again, my children would never set foot in a public school because it's just horrible. I, I, I listen to what the kids say when they come home. I've got, I've got five rental grandchildren ranging in, ranging in age from seven to uh, 20. And um, <laughs> it, uh, the things that they learn in school and in the world is just shattering mind shattering soul shattering I quake just hearing the things that they learn in school Bill good to see you God bless you so God destroyed Judah because of idolatry they went a whoring after other gods that is one of the reasons he's destroying the United States. 
The second reason God destroyed Judah, of course, as I just said, is sacrificing their children. Uh, the blood of the innocents, which he's destroying us for right now, sacrificing our children. The third reason was believing lies. That was the third reason that God destroyed Judah. And that is the reason, the third reason that he is destroying us now. There is no reprieve. There is no remedy. You can't stop it. He's already made the decision. Remember, the remedial judgments began on November 22nd, 1963. When we didn't return to him, he began the punitive judgment on September 11th, 2001. And that will continue until we're gone. Um, we may still be here, but we won't be who we are now. So, the lies that Judah believed were two. They believed in 610 B.C. under good King Josiah, they believed that God would not destroy Jerusalem because that's where the temple was. Surely God won't do this because this is where his name is. This is the place that is called by his name, so he won't destroy it. Surely God won't destroy the United States because he made a covenant with us. He didn't make a covenant with a country. He made a co covenant with the pilgrims who came here to the land to build a shining city on a hill and to dedicate the land to God. God's covenant is with the land, not with a country, not with a nation, not with a government. It has nothing to do with what happened in 1776, but only what happened in 1620. That was the covenant. There's no covenant in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence or the Gettysburg Address, for that matter, between this country and God. It does not exist. And it never did. So disabuse yourself of those notions. It is, uh, it is just a, uh, uh, an alternative history promoted by people who want to raise money. It is not real. It is the product of dominionist and reconstructionist and covenant theologians and replacement theologists. Uh, doesn't matter. The point is, is that they believe that God wouldn't destroy Judah and Jerusalem because of the temple. We believe that he won't destroy the United States because we're his people. We're not his people. Regathered Israel are his people. Scattered Israel is his people. God only has one people. The ignorance, the utter ignorance that we encounter daily. Read your Bible. The lie that they believed next in 602 was that there would be peace and the prophets and the priests, the princes, the king's court and the king himself and all the rich people, people who ran things and decided things and spent all the money. They said there was peace because they were paying booty, bounty, tribute, taxes to the king of Babylon to, to let them stay there. So they had a puppet king in Jehoiakim. And uh, they said there was peace, but there was no peace. Nebuchadnezzar had landed armies in barges in Dan on the Mediterranean coast. They were working their way toward Jerusalem and occupying the country as they went. He had sent armies into what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel, whose capital was Samaria. And they were pressing southward with armies through the old Assyrian Empire, which Babylon had overcome and taken and subsumed into themselves. And Babylonian soldiers are pressing toward them across modern Syria and Jordan and western Iraq. They have to either control or conquer Israel because they're doing war. They're having a war, Babylon is, with the last remaining power that threatens their world dominance, and that's Egypt.
we believe the lie too, that there will be peace, but there's no peace. There's no peace in the streets. There's no peace in homes. There's there's no peace of the spirit. Uh, there's no peace in politics. There's no peace in the government. There's no peace in the world. Uh, <laughs> how can you have peace, you know, when you got half the people of this country ready, 40% of the people in this country ready to kill the other 40%. And, uh, and and then on top of that, all the anti-Semitism that's going on right now. Good morning, Charlie. God bless you. It's just, uh, it is the stuff, as a Humphrey Bogart said in the Maltese Falcon when they saw that the, the Falcon was solid gold. And so that's the stuff dreams are made of. That's the stuff dreams are made of, kid. Uh, well... What we have in this country now is the stuff that nightmares are made of. You don't know whether you're going to wake up in your bed or whether you're going to have your throat cut. Good morning, Sarah. Good old Sarah. God love you. God bless you. So, because they believed in falsehood, because they forgot God, Remember, we believe in falsehoods, and we have forgotten God. God says in verse 26, Therefore will I discover thy skirts upon their face, that thy shame may appear. I'm going to strip you naked so everybody can see how awful you are. And that has more to do with, do with ripping off her skirt. <laughs> it's symbolic. It's going to rip away all the pretense he's going to rip away all the lies he's going to rip away all the excuses and let the people see themselves as they are and let the world see them as they are this is i've seen thine adulteries and thy nags and the lewdness of thy whoredoms and thine abominations on the hills and the fields woe unto thee o jerusalem wilt thou not be made clean when shall it once be? I have seen thy adulteries. He stripped us bare. I have seen thy adulteries. He's speaking specifically now about spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication, where Israel and Judah went a whoring after other gods. Israel did it a lot earlier. Uh, it really intense. It was from the beginning when Jeroboam, who, who, to whom God gave the ten tribes in the northern kingdom, whose capital was at Samaria, when he built the golden calves and put them at Bethel and at Dan. And he said, here, Israel, here's your gods that brought you up out of Egypt, worship them. Because he didn't want people to go to Jerusalem because he thought if people went to Jerusalem that he would lose his kingdom. So he kept them inside as best he could with these false gods. That was the lure. Most of the Levites wound up migrating back down south because the temple was there and their service was to the temple. Even though God had given Jeroboam the tribe of Levi. And if he would have trusted God, then God would have worked something out. Maybe he would have had something like the tabernacle up there. We don't know because Jeremiah was a, a, an idol worshiper from the beginning. And he made everybody worship there. He made priests out of the lowest people. You know, I tell people all the time, that I'm an unlearned and ignorant man, just like John and Peter were before the council, the Sanhedrin, the high priest and his family there when they arrested him at the end of chapter, at the first of chapter four. It's almost hard for me to criticize Because I've had such a terrible, wasted life. I spent 20 years drunk. You know, it got worse 
after I sobered up and everybody thought I was okay in my early 20s, mid-20s. But then I, I jumped in and stayed drunk for a long time. I was running from God. So it's hard for me, even after nearly 27 years sober, 26 years preaching, it's hard for me to be critical of people who have all the credentials. And I'm talking about all the leaders of the currently ruling junta of the church business. You know, the ones you see on TV and on the Christian channels, so-called Christian channels, religious channels on the cable. And uh, you hear on the radio, different ministries, different famous preachers. Because I don't have anywhere to stand except on the word of God and experience. And the reason that we're in the shape we're in is because the pulpit ministry in the United States is so weak. There are many good preachers. There are many good churches. But as a whole, you know, we forgot what Jesus called to called us to. He called us to 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 to, to pain and persecution, and death, and torture for His name. Yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're not being persecuted by someone, you're not living godly in Christ Jesus. Because the converse is true, the inverse. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say may. It doesn't say could. It says shall. All that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Spiritual adultery. Idolatry, fornication. It's all happening because the pulpit ministry in the United States has made building a big ministry their God. They have made church work their God. They have made activity their God. They have made programs they have God. They have forgotten the Son of God who bought them with a price, and they are not their own. Just like he bought me with a price, and I am not my own. God is not impressed with all these things, all these works of men. That call evil good and good evil. They give in to the society and say it's okay to the point where most people who say they're Christians don't know Christ. If they knew Christ, they would live differently. You can't belong to Christ and sin without repercussion. I'm not saying you can't sin. But when you do sin, the Holy Ghost will beat you up so bad that he will bring you back into line pretty quick. You can't get away with it. You see, you can, you can sin after you get saved, but you won't enjoy it. It won't make you happy. I've heard one preacher say one time, and he says, I, you know, after I got saved, he said, I can sin all I want to. But the thing is, is I don't want to anymore. See, when you're truly saved, you do not want to sin anymore. You don't want to do it. I've seen that in adulteries. I've seen you follow after other gods. 
I've seen you trust in politicians. I've seen you trust in fascists and demagogues. I've seen you trust in would-be dictators. I've seen you trust in, in communism. I've seen you trust in Marxism. I've seen you trust in movie stars. You trusted in all them, God says, instead of me. And thy neighings and the lewdness of thy whoredom. I want a God who won't punish me for being a pervert, who won't punish me for being an adulterer, who won't punish me for being a fornicator, who loves me just as I am, who won't punish me for having unnatural affections, who won't punish me for, as a male, being effeminate, or as a female, being masculine. He won't punish me for that, because it's all okay. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. The names. That is the way he phrases the lust of a stud going after a mare or a filly. I got to have you, I'm going to have you now, and then he mounts her. That's the way the horses neigh for one another. They'll kick down the stall rails to get to that mare. They will kick down the stall rails to get in there and do their business. The neighings. So that's how you act toward one another in your whoredoms and your fornications. And then back, he turns it back to... He's in spiritual adultery, then he's in physical adultery and comparing it to spiritual adultery. He just right back into spiritual adultery, the lewdness of thy whoredoms. Where you have men who are only men stand on stages and say, God told me this. God told me this this morning. Uh, I had a dream. I had a vision. This is what God wants. God already said what he wants. Everything else is irrelevant. It's just something in your head. This is the word of God and everything else isn't. I tell you what. The minute someone looks at me and says, God told me, I don't hear anything after that. Because whatever they say, it may mean something to them, but it won't mean anything to me. If any of some of my friends, if they're watching this closely, they may be offended by this, but I don't care. I must tell you the truth. To the law and to the testimony, if it speaketh not thereto, it is because there is no light in them. All of these new prophets, new apostles, the new apostolic reformation, covenant theology, dominionism, where they're going to take over the world for Jesus. It's all a bunch of bull. It's something that has come out of fevered brains where they want to heap more power under men. Always the men who are running these organizations and these ministries. That's the lewdness of the whoredom. Ow. What a deal, man. God bless you. He was very fast when we were in high school. And tall. And thine abominations on the hills and the fields. The abominations and the fornication he's talking about there is when they would go and worship other gods. When they would go into the fields and offer grain offerings and meal offerings and bake cakes to the queen of heaven where they would go and hide in the fields and the hollows and sacrifice their children so that nobody would see them do it. And then when they would go up on the hills to the groves where they would carve out places gods 
like totem poles that they would worship, images of their gods, which were just devils. And they would burn incense on all the high places because they would climb up high because they figured God would see them better. Their gods would see them better if they were up high. Because see, the real God, you can't hide from him. He can see you wherever you are, but they denied him. You don't have to climb up on a hill to see God and for God to see you. You don't have to crawl down in the corn stalks and hide for God not to see you because he can see you. You cannot hide from him wherever you are. He sees you. God says, I've seen all your abominations. Woe unto thee, O Jerusalem. Woe unto thee, America. I've seen everything you've done. I've seen everything you've done against me. I've seen everything you've done against my word. I've seen everything you do against my son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. Woe unto us. He was saying, woe unto them, Jerusalem. Wilt thou not be made clean? He said, come on, isn't there anybody there that wants to straighten up and fly right? Come to me now. I'll save you. I'll protect you. I'll deliver you from the wrath to come. When shall it once be? What he's really saying here is, when are you going to be like you used to be? And it's almost a wistful thing, like you were never like you're supposed to be, but you used to be closer. And it says, I wish that you were like I intended you to be. God is saying the same thing about us right now. The church in the United States that worships everything except the God who lives forever. When Will you be what you're supposed to be? And were you ever, at least once, were you ever like you were supposed to be? You know, <laughs> Jeremiah, in the short book following Jeremiah, he writes in his Lamentations that about the nature of God and how he doesn't really let things slide because he's just and there must be justice. But in verse 22 of the Lamentations, which Jeremiah also wrote, it's a long poem about the fall of Jerusalem. Verse 23 of chapter 3, verse 22 23 it says it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because we ought to be for our sin for all is sin and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord it is of the Lord's mercies good morning Pam God bless you it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. You know, you know that song, Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. They are born new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning.
great is thy faithfulness. Come to me, all ye ends of the earth, and be saved. He's telling Jerusalem and Judah, I got your number. I'm taking down your leadership. I'm taking you into captivity, but I will deliver you if you return to me. I will save you from the wrath to come. He's talking to the individual people, not to the country. The nation is going to fall. There's nothing anybody can do about it. The scripture says that there was no remedy. We have reached that point in the United States. There is no remedy. But he's saying the same thing to us. He says, you come to me. And I will deliver you from the wrath to come. That if thou shalt believe. If, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. It's too late for the nation. We done ripped our britches. We killed too many innocents. Too much innocent blood. Too much fornication. Too much sexual perversion. Too much idolatry. And too many lies. Remember, the bottom line is, all of this is coming upon you because God says, Thou hast forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. And that's where we are. You can't save the country. But you can save yourself by trusting in Jesus Christ and letting him save and deliver you from the wrath to come. The great thing about trusting in Jesus is it's not your problem anymore. It's up to him to provide and protect, and he will. He's never turned anybody down. He's never led anybody down. Wilt thou be made clean? When? How about now? You can. God says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. God love you.